Shalom, Yasharallah. I'd like to start by saying I want to give all praise, glory, and honor to Yahweh Bashem Yahushai, Bashem Rakakwadash, for my worship, double honor, honors to my elder apostles of Great Millstone, who taught me this word in sincerity and the truth. Salutations to the whole for elect throughout the whole world who are believing and teaching this gospel and spreading it out until the time of Yahweh Shai's coming, until the time of our salvation. And salutations be to the great cloud of witnesses of Yahshua all right, who are witnessing us in this ministry, you know, or do this ministry and spreading this gospel and helping us out the best way they can. Yeah, so today is uh, December 21st, four days, four days until the Feast of Saturnalia, or the Feast uh, to Bac Bacchus, right, um, which is a completely sat satanic feast day that Esau celebrated, and uh, They they pretty pretty much made it uh, legal, right? They put it into law for for uh, so-called Christmas to be celebrated on December 25th, which that has nothing to do with our Lord, the, the birth of our Lord, or or who the, whom the world called Jesus Christ. Well, no, they could say Jesus Christ. That's a different God. All right, Jesus Christ is nothing but Bacchus. All right, and December twenty fifth is nothing but the uh, what they call Sol Invictus, the day of the unconquerable sun. Right. Um. Actually, that comes in during the winter solstice, which the winter solstice I believe comes in a little before before that. Um, but it lasts all the way up to December 25th. So it's a celebration that the pagans celebrated, which is nothing, which is demonic. It's it's uh, you know the worship of Bacchus, the worship of different gods. And uh, I got this video here that uh, I just wanted to play for you. And this is mainly for I mean this is definitely for you know uh, a refresher for the uh, the older Akim that have been in the faith, that have been in the trenches, you know, for a while, you already know this. But, you know, but um, uh, mainly for the, the new, the newcomers into the faith, you know, so, you know, get their weight up and their history on this, you know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the video and, uh, you know, just pay attention and do your own studies, too, on it. Shalom. And what you see here is the the a statue of the god Bacchus. He has a, a cup of wine or strong drink in his right hand. And he got some grapes on the left hand because the feast of Bacchus was known to be a, a, a feast of orgies, right? People committing um, homosexual acts, lewdness behavior having sex on uh, on the streets you know men men with men men with women women with women shit probably men with children back then right same thing is happening now it's not out on the streets yet uh, but the way this place is going that's that's what you're gonna that's what you're gonna end up seeing man. so let me just play the video It is a time of magic, pageantry, warmth, generosity, and love. For many of us, our fondest childhood memories revolve around the traditions of Christmas. It is a time that many around the world celebrate as the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior and Messiah of mankind. In recent years, however, the spiritual holiday has become a time of mass marketing and crass commercialism. Incredibly, Many businesses derive more than half their yearly income during this period. 
The process of gift giving, once thought to have come from the story of the wise men who offered gifts to the newborn Christ, has evolved into the buying frenzy we see today during the month of December. But what about the other Christmas traditions? Have you ever wondered why we decorate the Christmas tree? Why we light the Yule log? Why we hang the mistletoe? And why we teach our children to believe in Santa Claus? In the next hour, you will discover the true origins of Christmas. You may be surprised. during late December, the days are at their shortest lengths and the nights are at their longest. For those of the pagan world, this has always been the greatest time of the year to celebrate and practice the works of darkness. The pagan calendar identifies this period as the winter solstice. It was during the pre-Christian midwinter pagan celebrations of Scandinavia's Norsemen where today's Christmas traditions began. As a means of honoring the pagan sex and fertility god Yule, a 12-day celebration during the month of December was inaugurated. A large single log considered to be a phallic idol was lit on fire and kept burning for 12 days. Animal or human sacrifices were offered in the fire on each of those days. Wild, delirious reveling accompanied the daily sacrifices as drunken participants defiantly strove to make contact with spirits. A thousand miles away in pre-Christian Rome, celebrants were paying homage to their own gods during the winter solstice. Witchcraft traditions hold that a number of pagan gods were given birth during this period, including Dionysus, Attis, and Baal, chief male god of fertility and licentiousness. Another pagan god from Persia, identified as Mithra, was said to have been born specifically on December 25th. Mithra was the god of the unconquerable sun, the god of the light between heaven and earth, worshipped at that time by an influential Roman cult. His birth symbolized an end to the long nights and a return to the dominance of the sun. During the month-long winter solstice celebration, courts in Rome were closed. Any and all crimes were allowed. Homosexuality, cross-dressing, and uncontrolled debauchery reigned supreme. Rome's order was turned upside down. Even children were allowed to join in the drunken orgies as part of the juvenilia celebration. By 270 AD, the Roman Emperor Aurelian had made it official, setting aside a seven-day period from December the 17th through the 24th, culminating in an exchange of gifts on December the 25th to celebrate the birth of the Sun God. This Roman orgy to end all orgies later became known as Saturnalia, in honor of the god Saturn, the god of excess. Roman soldiers invading Britain brought with them their pagan orgiistic traditions. Upon taking root in England, Saturnalia became known as the Festival of Fools reigned over by the Lord of Misrule. By the 4th century, the influential government-sanctioned Church of Rome, unable to outlaw the growing number of pagan practices, chose instead to adopt them into their so-called official Christianity. The Church believed this would attract more pagans to their fold. Up until this time, the birthday of Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah, had not been celebrated at all. Ignoring scriptures, however, indicating that the birth probably did not occur during the winter, the church nevertheless confused biblical history and made Jesus' birthday coincide with the pagan god Mithra. The birth date of the sun god had now become the birth date of the son of God. It was hoped that the pagan celebrations of Saturnalia would merge into this new legally sanctioned form of Christianity. The Church's practice of changing the dates of Christian events to coincide with pagan festivals continued, and by the 7th century, Pope Gregory I had ordered Augustine of Canterbury to incorporate any and all pagan practices and customs into the expanding Roman Catholic Church. During the Middle Ages, 
the debased Mardi Gras atmosphere of what was now known as Christ's Mass had reached a fevered pitch. Common practices included open sex in the streets, rioting, murder, and a number of pagan druidic Halloween rituals. This blood-drenched celebration got so out of hand that by 1652, following the execution of King Charles I, Christ's Mass was finally outlawed in England. A religious reform movement began sweeping the country led by Puritan Oliver Cromwell. The Puritans took the biblical mandate seriously which commanded that Christianity remain pure and separate from paganism. Despite their noble efforts, the celebration simply went underground and by 1656, after only four short years under the ban, the public's demand for the legalization of Christ's Mass had become insurmountable. The appointment of Charles II to the throne restored England's monarchy and with it the celebration of Christ's Mass. The Puritans had lost England, but they held high hopes for the new world. When the first settlers came from England, uh, they were, for the most part, Puritans. They came here for religious freedom. They came here to be free to worship God without a hierarchy and without the corruption of the organized church that they had known before. And uh, when they came, they came with the clear knowledge of the danger of these pagan practices that had become so dear to the hearts of uh, their ancestors. Following England's lead in 1659, the colonies of America had likewise outlawed Christmas. For 200 years, the clergy in New England battled to keep the riotous celebrations honoring the pagan god Saturn from infiltrating the New World. The Reverend Cotton Mather had warned in a Christmas Day sermon in 1712, Can you, in your conscience, think that your Holy Savior is honored by hard drinking, lewd reveling, and by a mass fit for none but Borcus or Saturn? But the public's taste for sin and revelry persisted. In 1828, gang rioting during the Saturnalia-like Christmas celebrations got so bad that cities such as New York were forced to institute a professional police force for the first time in order to control the savagery. Christmas was not only not widely celebrated, in many cases, uh, many places, Christmas celebrations were actually outlawed. And this was because of uh, the attitude of many of the churches who regarded it as primarily as a pagan celebration and as a reproach to the Lord. By the mid-19th century, American churches were the last remaining holdout in the war against the validation of Christmas. However, they too finally succumbed as a result of the efforts of the American Sunday School Society, who began advocating Christmas programs for children as a method of filling the pews. The society argued that children could be taught about the birth of Christ through the reenactment of the nativity. They also offered candy and treats to the children as a means of enticing families into accepting the holiday despite its notorious history and blatantly pagan roots. The successful technique of bribing children with candy would later be used on an unsuspecting American populace in the effort to promote the acceptance of the pagan rituals of Halloween. However, it was the work of England's most popular writer, Charles Dickens, whose ghostly 1843 book, A Christmas Carol, cemented the Christmas holiday in the hearts of Americans forever. Dickens' well-loved story made the pagan Christmas feasts, shining trees, glittering shops, and family warmth irresistible to those wanting to experience the holiday. Coming to America in 1867 to promote his work, Charles Dickens packed theaters as he read his story to cheering audiences around the country. A Christmas carol gripped America and destroyed any final attempt to stop the evolution of Christmas. By 1875, the Puritans had been beaten and by 1890, all American states had voted to make Christmas a legal holiday. Today's tradition of the Christmas Yule Log stems directly from the worship of the pre-Christian Scandinavian fertility god Yule. 
The burning of this phallic idol is also responsible for the concept of the 12 days of Christmas, which represented the 12 daily sacrifices offered up in the Yule Logs flames. Another uh, good example of the uh, pagan elements of Christmas is the whole concept of Yule and the Yule Log. The, uh, the very term is derived from uh, uh, the Norse god Yule, spelled J-U-L. And uh, uh, every year around Christmas time, uh, a huge log was uh, uh, cut down and uh, fashioned into a uh, fertility symbol and then burned uh, for 12 days. And on each successive day, a, a, a new sacrifice to the god Yule was performed uh, uh, in the fire, and a new sacrificial victim was uh, was burned to death. Uh, sometimes, but not always, the sacrificial victims were uh, human beings. And the whole uh, notion of the 12 days of Christmas also comes to us from this uh, Norse pagan tradition. In an attempt to blur the origins of this horrific ritual, the Church of Rome placed the first day of the Mass of Christ on December 25th and the 12th day on January the 6th. Despite no scriptural references for January the 6th, it was selected as the day the wise men supposedly arrived to offer gifts to the newborn Christ. This day then has become known as Epiphany. During the Dark Ages, the European custom of putting an oil-lighted wick lamp in the windows during the 12 days of Christmas signified to neighbors that the occupants were participating in the pagan worship of the phallic idol Yule. In today's commercialism, this is where we get the tradition of decorating our houses with Christmas lights. The Yule log custom was originally brought over to America by Scandinavian immigrants during the 1600s. And despite attempts to ban the tradition, it has stayed with us to this very day. Today, when we wish someone Yuletide greetings, we are in a sense invoking the power of the fertility god Yule upon that person. During the Saturnalia celebrations, holly and other greens were hung over doorways as part of a pagan ritual to ward off evil. To deck the halls with boughs of holly was to acknowledge the powers of the nature gods. According to Wiccan rituals, placing holly or other greens in the shape of a circle or wreath accentuated its magical power. Similarly, mistletoe, when used in the casting of Wiccan or Druidic spells, could render a woman helpless and open to sexual exploitation. This is where we get our custom of hanging mistletoe in doorways today and if a woman is caught underneath, she may be kissed and must not resist. The fir tree, uh, the mistletoe, uh, all of these things uh, typically uh, are come from uh, uh, overtly uh, pagan traditions, uh, in, typically in, from Northern Europe, German, Norse, and uh, English. Likewise, evergreen trees have always represented sex and fertility in pagan cultures. During the winter solstice, trees would be chopped down, brought inside, set up, and decorated as idols for worship. The Christmas tree was regarded uh, as, a, as a sacred tree. Uh, the, uh, the pagans of Northern Europe uh, typically uh, worshipped trees. They uh, regarded trees uh, and groves as sacred. So uh, uh, the bringing of the uh, tree into the house would be a way of uh, bringing this uh, supernatural Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm going to stop it there, and I'll come back with a part two to continue the video. Um, you know, brothers, make sure that, you know, for you newer brothers anyway, and the few believing sisters out there, you know, watch this. Watch this and study it, and, you know, make sure that you're, you're, you know, you try your best to keep your children away, you know, your, you know, you know, as far as unbelieving husbands and wives, well, they're technically they're they're pagans, so they're they're gonna they're gonna worship this satanic ass holiday, not knowing. But do your best to teach teach them, you know, and let them know. All right, so that they be so that they be mindful of what it is. It's sat purely satanic. 
Alright, so with that, I'm going um, to stop it there and continue with the part two. Shalom.